You are watching McLaren Port here on Today's Health, and I'm speaking with vascular surgeon Dr. Catherine Foley about conditions that can affect our legs. So, Dr. Foley, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And let's um, talk about some of the common conditions, uh, vascular conditions, really, that, that can affect people's legs. Yeah, so in the legs, there's arteries and veins. You can have problems with either. In the arteries, you can have hardening of the arteries or atherosclerotic disease, much like we talked about before. Um, that is caused by the high cholesterols and other risk factors most namely smoking, um, that cause narrowings and blockages to increase pain in the legs. And then as far as the veins go, there's issues like blood clots or DVTs, as well as varicose veins. So let's start with the peripheral artery disease. Som uh, sometimes we are, we're famous for using our jargon and it's often referred to as PAD, correct? Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so it's the hardening of the arteries or atherosclerotic disease. It's caused when the artery wall gets injured over time by toxins, whether it's from smoking or issues having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or diabetes that cause this plaque to build up in the arteries. So if someone has um, PAD, what kind of symptoms would they present with? Typically, the patients will say that they have issues with walking. They'll get like a Charlie horse type pain in their legs after they walk a certain distance that gets better or alleviated when they rest. If the disease is bad enough, it can go on to create ulcerations or non-healing wounds that happen on the legs because there's not enough blood flow to heal them. Is there anything that people can do to prevent PAD? Typically things like quitting smoking, um, abstaining from that, and then utilizing sometimes medications to help cholesterol and blood pressure medications, keeping those things in line. And uh, what kind of treatment options are available for someone that does have PAD? We start off typically with more um, conservative measures, you know, walking more. People who walk further over time develop more collaterals or kind of bypasses to the blood flow, and then you're able to walk further. Uh, but if it becomes something that's lifestyle limiting or causing you enough issues, there's options for surgery, whether it be endovascular through the inside of the, the vessel or an open surgery like a bypass. And when would you know, like how do you diagnose it and when do you determine whether it's something you can treat medically or with surgery? So typically a patient will see us in the office and we'll get their history and decide, you know, if they sound like it's more of an arterial problem that they're having. The next step is to get some imaging so we get an ultrasound and look at the pressure differences. So it's like blood pressure cuffs on the legs and we're measuring the differences and comparing it to the level of the arms, to the level of the legs to decide if there's any significant blockages in the, in the middle between those two areas. And then going on for maybe CT scans or a possible angiogram, um, which people know about from heart, heart catheterizations, it's similar, but we're looking at the legs now instead of the heart. So I believe you have some examples to show us what peripheral artery disease actually looks like. I do, so this is a patient who had um, the lifestyle limiting claudication, so that pain when they're walking and troubles with that, that cramping type pain. Um, this is going on to an angiogram so that we poke a hole in the artery and take a picture with contrast looking exactly where the blood is flowing and where it isn't. As you can see right here, this is the femoral artery up in the thigh. It should be a continuous black line all the way down here where it connects down below her. There's a bunch of uh, collaterals, which is the body's own bypasses that it's been making. So what we're able to do through the inside of the artery is put a wire across and then do some procedures basically like rotor rootering the artery to clean out that plaque. And finally you can see the picture of the completed portion. You can see the continuous black line and then those collateral vessels go away because the path of least resistance now is through the main and normal channel. And then this is just below the knee. Typically in normal anatomy everybody has three vessels below the knee as their runoff. And then so let's talk about the, the veins. We talked about the arteries. So you had mentioned um, the DVTs or the deep vein thrombosis. Can you explain that? So a DVT happens or a deep vein thrombosis happens in the veins, typically in the legs is most common. And what happens is the blood, uh, for lack of better terms, curdles and causes a clot in that area because it's not flowing properly. So what can happen is over time, if it's not treated, especially the ones in the legs, can be problematic and go up to the, the lungs and cause blockage in the blood flow to the lungs, which can be life-threatening. So who would be at risk for developing a DVT? People who tend to have DVTs are ones who are sedentary more than normal. So someone who's been on a long trip, a long car ride greater than six hours, if they're going um, to have a surgery or a long flight, anyone who's had a trauma, 
Um, and then other, other reasons to have blood clots are the genetic reasons behind it, that your body is just predisposed to being the stickier in the blood. So it's someone that's probably older, maybe at higher risk then for DVT? They tend to be a little bit higher risk, yes. And then if so, if an older person says like, oh, I'm, I know I'm going to be on a, a long car ride, are there any tips or suggestions that you could say helps prevent that? Yeah, usually we recommend breaking up the car ride. So if you have opportunity after a couple of hours to get out and walk around, even a couple of walks around the car, or there's uh, compression stockings tend to help in the same in the same manner. Or if you're going to be on a long flight and can't do much walking, even just that motion of moving your legs up and down, you know, pressing on the gas pedal with your feet as you're just sitting still tends to help because the muscle moves the blood through the vein. And so what would um, someone, what kind of symptoms would they have if they have a DVT? If you have a DVT, you're going to notice a lot of swelling in your leg, a lot of redness and pain. And the leg typically becomes almost twice the size of the normal leg would have been. Uh, it becomes hot and severely painful, mostly due to the swelling. And how long does before something like that swelling would occur? Like when would you expect it? Usually it's fairly soon after you get the DVT. It's not that you have a DVT and then a couple months later you get the swelling. They usually come in and conjoin with one another. And how is that usually treated? Typically DVTs or blood clots are treated with anticoagulation medication. Um, there are a few subset of patients who if left untreated or they have a severe clot itself, like we had talked about, can go up to the lungs and can be very significant. Um, there are people that might need a filter or a screen put in to catch anything from going to the lungs. And then another option, even if we have a significant burden of blood clot, is to do something to help break up the blood clot. There's ways that we can put catheters and medications in to help dissolve the blood clot. We do know that people who have severe clots in the legs, over time about half or a third of them will end up having severe problems called post-thrombotic syndrome. And basically that's just a symptom when people have significant swelling and ulcerations and problems because after a blood clot, the veins and the valves don't work the same. And how would you diagnose it like to determine what your course of action would be for treatment? Again, just like most of the vascular things, it's an ultrasound is where we start. Sometimes a CT scan can be helpful in delineating the actual location. If it is something that moves up to the lung, which would be called a pulmonary embolism, then we do that with a CT scan. And usually when that happens, then patients are experiencing a little bit different sy symptoms. That's correct. So if you have a PE or a pulmonary embolism, you have shortness of breath, uh, racing heart, just difficulty catching your breath, and a lot of times a lot of anxiety along with it. So if someone maybe thinks they have a DVT and then have those symptoms, it's, that should be treated emergently? Correct. So if you're at that point where you're having issues breathing, or in general, if you're overly concerned that something bad is going on, going to your nearest ER or calling 911 is the best way to go. Great. This has been really good information for our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching McLaren Port here on Today's Health. If you would like more information or to schedule an appointment, visit our website at www.mclaren.org forward slash phvascular. To watch additional videos, visit our website at www.mclaren.org forward slash phvideo. Thank you for watching McLaren Port here on Today's Health. I'm your host, Kelly DiNardo, and we'll see you next time.